Hello again, future respiratory therapist community. Respiratory coach here. I got a question from Handle My Show, and it wants to know about respiratory failure using an ABG versus a VBG. Can I talk about how do you use them to determine hypoxia, and how do you determine hypercapnia using ABG versus VBG? I've done a video similar to this. It wasn't in response to hypercapnia and hypoxia using a VBG, but it was in talking about the value of venous blood gas in relationship to arterial blood gases and how are they, how are they, what are the, what is their relationship? And so I'm going to link to that video so that you can watch that video if you haven't, because it's a phenomenal video in breaking down how the two uh, arterial blood in terms of blood gases, how it relates to venous blood. So I put this number on the board and this is exactly what you'll see if you watch that other video, you'll see something very similar to this. This is ABG, this is VBG. Now we gotta go back to the physiology of what's happening. Arterial blood is taking oxygenated blood out to the tissues. You have internal respiration happening at the level of the tissues. They are consuming oxygen and they are giving off CO2. They're consuming oxygen, producing CO2. They give that CO2 back to the blood. That blood returns back to the heart where it picks up more oxygen through external respiration, through the alveoli. Oxygen goes into the pulmonary capillaries. That CO2 comes out of the pulmonary capillaries and it continues around and around, right? Now, if you understand that concept, then you understand that CO2 is naturally going to be higher in venous blood because, well, before I say that, and oxygen is naturally going to be lower in venous blood because the tissues are taking oxygen from the arterial blood and putting CO2 into the arterial blood. So that's the first thing you need to understand is that it makes sense why venous blood has a higher CO2 concentration and a lower oxygen concentration than arterial blood just by what's happening through internal respirations. Now, if you understand that venous blood has a higher, higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide in it, okay, the CO2 partial pressure is higher than arterial blood, then you should also understand that because of the higher carbon dioxide level, you also get a lower pH level. If CO2 in arterial blood goes up, pH goes down. Sorry, that's Venus. If arterial CO2 goes up, then arterial pH goes down. Well, it's the same thing in venous blood. If the venous blood has more CO2, CO2 is higher, then pH is lower. And that's the biggest thing to understand here, is that from a pH and a CO2 standpoint, Venous compared to arterial, your venous blood is going to be slightly more acidotic and have slightly more CO2. Those are the commonalities between the two. The bicarb is also essentially the same. So bicarb, venous versus arterial is essentially the same. Venous pH and venous CO2 will be slightly off but not significantly, which means they are good indicators. Okay, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, when we talk about PaO2, or we're talking about oxygen, normal ABG is 80 to 100, VBG 35 to 50. You cannot use a venous blood gas to assess oxygenation. You cannot. I'll say it again. You cannot use a venous blood gas to assess oxygenation. There is no correlation between the two. So don't fall into that trap. Don't look at this and go, oh, 35? They must be hypoxic or hypoxemic, two different terms there, okay? When you look at an arterial blood gas, you can assess hypoxemia, the level of oxygen in the blood by looking at your ABG. If it's 80 to 100, then your patient is not hypoxemic, but they still might be hypoxic. So I'm going to talk about this first because your question talked about using a VBG versus an ABG to determine two things, hypoxia and hypercapnia. So let's talk about hypoxia. The term hypoxia refers to 
a decreased level of tissue oxygenation. Now, to, ca- to, to give us a visual of how much oxygen <clears throat> excuse me, is actually reaching the tissues, then we don't even need this number. Okay? So let's, let's clarify this thought process right here. And ABG is also not alone, is not beneficial in assessing hypoxia. It's useful in assessing hypoxemia, but not hypoxia. To prove this, you have to go back to this formula right here, the CaO2 equals hemoglobin times 1.34 times our SaO2, right? And then we add to that our PaO2 times 0.003. This is the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in plasma. This is the amount that's bound to hemoglobin. Now, if you understand this formula, you understand that this top part is the driving mechanism that tells you about the total O content total O2 content that is being made available to the tissues for oxygenation. That means hemoglobin and saturation are our two biggest drivers, with hemoglobin being our first. Obviously, if our SAO2 is 50%, then you cut your hemoglobin in half. That makes sense. But we don't typically see patients routinely with saturations at 50%. We much more commonly see patients with a hemoglobin of 8 and an SAO2 of 91% with a PAO2 of, I don't know, whatever you want to say, 62. This is more common, right? Now we're going to change this example just a little bit. Let's say we have a saturation of 99% and we have a PAO2 of 96 now, this patient, regardless of what the VBG is, this is a, not an indicator, so we don't even need to talk about hypoxia and VBG, okay? When we talk about this, we would all agree that this patient is not hypoxemic. But when we put these numbers into this formula, 8 times 1.34 times 99% is going to give us a number, I don't where did my phone go? Well, I don't even know where it is. Oh, here it is, right here. We can do the calculations here real quick, okay? So, when we do 8 times 1.34 times 0.99, we see that we have, what we get is 10.6. Now, now this is the first part of this formula. Now we're going to add to that PaO2 times 0.003, 96 plus 0.003. I did plus, not multiply. Plus 0.28. So you realize where this arterial oxygenation, from just the PaO2 standpoint, not talking about bound to hemoglobin, only adds 0.28. So we go from 2.6 to 10.88. 10.6 to 10.88. This person's carrying capacity is roughly half of what it should be. 17 to 20, right? And we're sitting here at 10. So is this patient hypoxic? Probably. Why? Because they don't have enough carrying capacity. So that's what you'll use to determine hypoxia. Not so much on the VBG side of things. You can use <clears throat> this formula to determine total O2 content being delivered to the tissues. That talks about hypoxia. Now, if there's not, let's say this patient right here, 10.8, there's a good possibility they have an increased lactate because of the decreased amount of oxygen actually being delivered to the tissues creates a state of anaerobic metabolism, which creates an increased lactate, which creates a metabolic acidosis, which you would see on your blood gas by a decrease in your bicarb. Okay. Now, you could also probably see the metabolic acidosis on your VBG, but your PaO2, I mean, your PVO2 is no help in assessing 
if the patient is hypoxemic. Hypoxia and hypoxemia, two different things. You got to understand that first. Now, the other question you, you asked me about was hypercapnia. So let's talk about that for a second, okay? Let's say you draw a blood gas, but you get venous blood. You're going to get something like this. Let's say you get 7.22, you get a CO2 of 68, you get a PaO2 of 35 with a SAT of 70%, and your bicarb is 24. Now, how do you know this is venous blood? You tried to get an arterial blood, you tried to get arterial blood, but you came up, you missed, and you got venous blood. And when you see this, you go, wait a second. My patient was satting 96%. So this doesn't match up, which means this has got to be venous blood, right? So you have no, you, you know your patient's sats are 96%, which is a good indication of adequate oxygenation, at least arterial PaO2. Your PaO2 is probably adequate because your SpO2 is 96%. Do you have an oxygenation problem? Probably not, right? Can your patient be hypoxic? Maybe. We don't. We got to go back to what we just talked about, right? But from a hypoxemia standpoint, patient with a SAT of ninety six percent, you're going. They have enough oxygen in their arterial blood. This is not a. This is not an oxygen in the blood issue, right? So, so this thirty five seventy percent. Your patient SAT's ninety six percent. This discrepancy tells you it's a venous blood gas. Now, what do we know about venous blood gases? We know that you're going to go back and you're going to redraw that blood, okay? And because we know that venous CO2 is relatively a decent reflection of arterial CO2, then we know that while the arterial CO2, I'm going to erase this, okay? I need to get rid of this. We know that arterial CO2 will be slightly... less than venous CO2. So let's say our arterial CO2 is 60. Well, we know our bicarb is going to be roughly the same. And if we know that our CO2 is slightly lower in our arterial blood than it is the venous blood, then we know our pH will be slightly higher. Okay? So do you know exactly, when you just have this information right here, do you know exactly what your arterial pH is? No. Do you know exactly what your arterial CO2 is? No. But do you have a reference? Do you think, you don't think that you're going to go back and draw the arterial blood gas and you're going to get this, right? You're not going to get this from this venous blood gas. You're going to get something more like this. So, to answer your question, you have to understand your normal values for your venous blood gases. Your CO2 normal is 40 to 50. If you get a CO2 of 50 on a venous blood gas with a pH of 7.31, then you're probably on the fringe of being 7.36 with a CO2 of around 45. Okay? You can't take it for absolute but you can use it as a reference. Does this patient, based off the VBG, do they need to be intubated? Probably so. Do you need to waste time drawing arterial blood gas, depending on patient presentation, to verify that, oh yes, my arterial CO2 is 60? Probably not, right? You can assume from this that your patient is going to be hypercapnic. And that's the point. That's, that's how you use this stuff. Okay, you understand your relationship between your venous blood and your arterial blood, and you can infer approximations. You're not, you're not, you're not ever, you're not, it doesn't have to be exact. You don't ever intubate somebody because of an exact. The patient is acidotic and respiratory acute ventilatory failure, and you, and, 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 and you take the the, the, the patient presentation and you intubate them. The fact that the patient is 
731 versus 733, or go even more extreme, 721 versus 727, that you see what I'm saying? That's not the that's not the driving factor here that 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 signifies whether you're gonna intubate that patient or not. It's not the exact number, it's the state of the body. And you can infer from a venous blood gas. We just proved it right here. If you get this blood gas, you can infer that your ABG is probably somewhere around here. Your ABG is not going to be normal if this is your VBG. That's how you use it. Now, most of the times, whether we like it or not, we're going to go back and draw the arterial blood gas, and we're going to get a blood gas that tells us the same thing. I've said this before in a previous video. I would love to see if there was ever, if there's a place out there that is using venous blood gases to, to not to absolutely treat or to make decisions off of, but if they're not using venous blood gases to, to, to initially drive care. Because like this example, it's obvious, right? There's no need to, to, to second guess, right? I would love to see what we could do with this, with the use of entitled CO2s, an initial arterial blood gas, the initiation of an entitled CO2. We're already using pulse oxes. Those two things alone are phenomenal ventilation indicators and the SVO2, the pulse oximeter, as an oxygenation indicator. With one initial VBG, and then with morning labs, instead of sticking an arterial puncture every single day, could we not infer and not continue to, with the use of an entitled CO2, could we not reduce sticks, arterial sticks to our patients with the monitoring of this? I'm just asking. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know of a place that's doing it. If you do and you're watching this or you're doing clinicals at a site where you're seeing these things, please tell me because I want to know. Because I'm interested in impacting not just my community, but the communities around us and, and throughout to say, hey, guys, if we know these two are good indicators, then why do we have to have an arterial blood gas? So RT's productivity revenue can stay high? Does that sound like, does that sound like the best interest of the patient or does that sound like the best interest of the department's productivity? Who says we can't run venous blood gases? We can. We do. So my show, I hope this answers your question. Kind of got off on a little tangent there and I apologize for that. But I hope you see the, um, the correlation between venous blood gas and arterial blood gases. And I hope you can use this in your practice as you learn how to be a respiratory therapist or if you are already one, working currently as a respiratory therapist. And overall, I hope everybody has a great day. I appreciate everybody for watching. Please leave a comment, a question, a concern. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. we got a great little community building here. It's a little FRT community, future respiratory therapists, and everybody's working together to aid and to enhance the learning mechanism at the people trying to become respiratory therapists, along with nurses who have interjected, along with patients who have interjected, along with current respiratory therapists, and all of us together, I hope, are becoming greater patient advocates and just better all-around clinicians. That's what I hope. Best wishes, guys.